So without further ado now, I have a chance to introduce uh, Kieran McIndor Shaw, who will be doing a fireside chat with, the, with our next CEO guest, and that's uh, Robert Bradway, who Kieran, I'll let you introduce. Uh, I'll introduce Kieran just briefly. Kieran is the founder and chairperson of Biocon. She is one of the most uh, inspirational and powerful leaders in the world. Uh, amongst her many honors, Kieran has been um, uh, anointed to the uh, Time Magazine 100 Most Influential People in the World, the Forbes Magazine 100 Most Powerful Women uh, in the World. And uh, Kieran has a, a, a kind soul, and she, she doesn't like the term ph philanthropist. She prefers the term compassionate capitalist, and she's done really amazing things for, pe for people and patients across the world with her wealth. So Kieran, thank you for all you've done. And now without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Andy. And it's great to have this virtual fireside chat with Bob Bradway, who actually needs no introduction because he is uh, you know, the big chief of Amgen, which to me is a very inspiring biotech company, a very iconic one. So Bob, uh, without uh, further ado, since we've got very limited time, um, let me say what a pleasure it is to, you know, have a chat with you. I'd love to have had it uh, in person, but as you know, you know, COVID is uh, kind of plunging us into uh, a very difficult time. You know, it's taking the fun out of these summits, but at the same time, I guess you and me haven't had the chance to synchronize our travel calendars many times in the past. So at least this way we're in, in the summit. Um, well, maybe not really in Boston, but somehow in Boston with uh, Andy and Karun. And I must uh, say that Arun and um, Karun and Andy, you've done a tremendous job of raising the profile of this summit. And I must congratulate you on your untiring efforts over the years, so congratulations. So let me start, Bob, by uh, you know, giving my huge congratulations to you and Amgen for uh, Lumacras. I think it's a phenomenal breakthrough especially given that uh, you know, the Keras G12C target was considered to be undruggable. And of course, uh, in my own small way, I guess I'm, I feel quite connected to that program because our scientists were a part of your, the bigger team uh, you know, from Sinjin Amgen Research Center in Bangalore. So I think we all feel so thrilled that you, know, you brought such a fantastic uh, drug to the market. And I guess my question to you is, uh, you know, how do you, you know, take decisions like this to invest uh, in such programs that have such enormous uh, scientific challenges? I mean, you expect this to happen in small, tiny biotechs, but how do you do it at Amgen? Well, first, Kieran, let me say it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, today. So uh, wonderful to, to see you, even if only virtually. Uh, what I would say first is that, um, we still feel like a small, uh, tiny biotechnology company, I guess, in some ways, uh, even though we invest $4 billion a year now in research and development. And really all of that research and development uh, investment is channeled at novel, innovative medicines. Uh, we're trying to push the boundaries of biotechnology uh, to develop breakthroughs for patients that are suffering from serious disease. So you mentioned Lumacras, which is a drug that the FDA just recently approved for uh, patients suffering from non-small cell lung cancer with a G12C uh, mutation. Uh, and as you say, that was a pretty daunting challenge, one that for 40 years scientists have been trying to address. Uh, and we were fortunate to, to find a way to drug what was once considered an undruggable target. Uh, and in less than 28 months from the time we dosed the first patient to uh, when we filed uh, the material with or the, the uh, application with regulators, we were able to generate data to show that this was a safe and effective way uh, to address this um, uh, mutation. And so we're excited about what it represents for patients. I must say I've been uh, amazed by the outpouring of reaction to the approval globally from people who recognize uh, that this really is a breakthrough in the field. And I hope it's encouraging uh, about what we should expect um, from uh, further developments uh, across the oncology landscape. Now, we're living in the bio century. And the pace of change is extraordinary. And this is just yet another example of that. So Bob, maybe, you know, leading on from that question, I'd like to ask you about uh, some of the unmet uh, 
challenges that we have in cancer in the developing world. You know, for example, gastric cancers. That this is a huge unmet need, at least I know in our part of the world. And I wonder if Amgen is planning to look at some of these kind of developing world cancers as well. Uh, we, yes, we are, Karen. We're also very active in looking at gastric cancer, which, as you uh, point out, is a very prevalent uh, form of cancer, particularly uh, in the uh, Asian uh, part of our uh, world. Uh, and uh, we have uh, we recently acquired a, a molecule which we expect to move quickly into phase three clinical development, uh, an antibody uh, called bemrituzumab, uh, which is directed at the FGFR2B receptor. So again, first in class, novel way uh, to try to uh, bring help to patients who are suffering from, uh, from gastric cancer. In addition, we have two uh, bispecific uh, T-cell engaging therapies that are directed at specific targets that we think may be relevant in gastric cancer. So uh, we see the potential for this field to be rapidly advancing and uh, I hope we'll find ourselves right in the middle of it. Uh, certainly excited about our late stage clinical asset of bemrituzumab. So would you be even uh, a pro, you know, considering doing some of these trials in India? We're certainly looking at global uh, registration of global trials and seeking to register uh, these medicines globally. Uh, and so uh, we will enroll patients uh, where the prevalence of the disease enables us to do that. Um, we'll look in India and we'll look at other countries, obviously, uh, in Asia. I expect that we'll have a very healthy global uh, development plan for these molecules. So let me get on to my second question, which is really about Operation Warp Speed. Uh, you know, we saw vaccines go from the lab to the market in just about 321 days. And I just thought I'd ask you what your questions are about uh, emergency use authorization uh, for vaccines and whether we should be using that for drugs as well. You know, I mean, basically, we addressed an unmet emergency need when it came to vaccines. And I guess you could almost talk about the same when it comes to certain unmet needs where you need to get you know, drugs faster to patients. And um, you know, I for one feel, for instance, that you know, all this controversy that we've had around uh, Biogen's uh, Alzheimer drug, you know, uh, could it have actually been solved by saying, uh, could it have been addressed by saying that, okay, let's give it an EUA and then back it with real world evidence. So is this something that you think we should be thinking about for drugs? Um, and, and, you know, what, I'd, I'd just like to hear your thoughts about uh, what you would think about this kind of a model. You know, it, it does mean it gets, us, uh, gets drugs faster to patients and the investment costs would be lower, I would imagine. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question, Karen, but let me try and answer it at a higher altitude. Uh, first, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't just take a moment to observe that uh, what we've seen in the development of the vaccines is extraordinary. And I hope everybody uh, outside of our industry recognizes what an amazing feat it is that, uh, as you said, in, in less than a year, uh, we have not just one, not just two, but several vaccines that have proven to be safe and effective to address um, the challenge uh, of COVID-19. So in a very short period of time, um, you know, the world uh, rallied around the scientific challenge of identifying this virus and then ways to uh, wrestle it to ground. And we've proven to be very successful so far uh, in that effort. And that we were able to do it that quickly and that effectively is really an extraordinary accomplishment. So um, again, I think for those who don't live in this industry every day, I hope they appreciate the scale of what was um, achieved here. It was really a landmark moment uh, in science and medicine. Uh, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from how that was possible. Uh, a lot we can learn from um, the way in which industry, uh, regulators, uh, government, academia came together to try to break uh, and solve a global problem. Uh, and I think we demonstrated that the power of biotechnology is extraordinary when the ecosystem is working together uh, to try to make a difference. And so, um, you know, is there uh, an opportunity to increase the tempo of drug discovery and drug development? Absolutely. Um, are some of the things that we learned uh, over the past 18 months applicable uh, to diseases going forward or to the drug, drug discovery development process? I think absolutely. And I think that will be one of the important challenges for innovators and for regulators 
is to figure out of the many things that we did differently for COVID, which of those should we continue to do? And which of those should we apply to uh, the, the kinds of uh, drug development and discovery that we routinely do in our industry? So I think there are opportunities. I hope that we will seize them, uh, whether it turns out to be in the form of emergency use authorization or some other method. Um, I, I don't know that I wanna to speak to that specifically, Kieran, but. I simply would, would like to shine the light on the fact that there are pathways that would enable us to move more quickly than we have in the past. Yeah, I think with all the technology and things, I'm sure accelerated pathways are going to happen sooner than later, I hope. So, you know, maybe I should also ask you a question about the fact that um, the world attention has really been focused on um, all things COVID, let me put it that way. Um, but I do think we need to really now start getting back to other areas. And I just wanted to ask you, what are the real disease areas that you think need urgent attention and innovative solutions? Yeah. Really, you know? Well, you know, there's, there's no more urgent uh, disease than heart disease. Uh, no disease kills more people uh, on our planet than heart disease. Uh, if I just focus for a moment here in the United States, uh, where hundreds of thousands of people lost their battle against uh, COVID over the past 18 months, um, we will uh, have many more people lose their battle against heart disease over the next uh, 18 months uh, than did to, to COVID-19. Uh, and so we ought to ask ourselves about uh, chronic diseases like uh, heart disease. Are there things that we could do differently? Um, and if there are things we could, could, do, could do differently, why don't we do them? Uh, and unfortunately, um, when we look at that question and the answer in, in, in heart disease, it's, it's uh, you know, it leaves us wanting. Uh, so are there ways for us to predict those who are at most uh, greatest risk of uh, succumbing to heart disease? Absolutely. We can predict which of our uh, fellow citizens are at greatest risk of a heart attack or stroke. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, if we can predict who they are, can we help prevent those events from occurring in the first place? And here again, the answer is very clear. Yes, we can. Uh, we and others have medicines, in our case, a medicine called Repatha, which profoundly lowers LDL cholesterol. Uh, and that's uh, an important way to reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke. So if we went after some of these chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, osteoporosis, uh, and heart disease, as I've already mentioned, with the kind of intensity that we went after COVID-19, I think we can make a big difference in the world. Uh, so I think it would be a pity if we uh, succeed as we are on track to do against COVID-19 and then re-enter uh, a status quo anti-world without asking ourselves, you know, what are the next big challenges for us as a society? Clearly heart disease is one of those big challenges and we have the tools to do something about it. Uh, so I'm hoping that, um, that when we get through COVID-19, we'll find new ways to energize the battle, the fight, uh, to make patients and regulators and payers and physicians aware that there, are, that there are alternatives. And we don't simply have to accept that 800,000 people will have a heart attack in the United States over the next 12 months, or 825,000 will have a, a stroke, or that hundreds of thousands of women will fracture in the setting of postmenopausal osteoporosis, when we can predict um, which of those um, uh, people are most likely, and in many cases, prevent those events from occurring in the first place. So I think chronic disease really, Kieran, is the next frontier for us. Uh, and we see it around us, all of us see it around us every day. Um, and I think the question for us will be, are we ready to take uh, that, to tackle that public health challenge? Yeah, in fact, uh, COVID it seem, itself seems to be having a post-COVID or a long-haul COVID uh, problem, which some of which is cardiac related, you know. So it, it'll be interesting to see what that turns out to be in terms of a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll sort of like now focus on a conversation we had a long time ago when we last met Bob, and that was about Amgen's digital strategy. Um, you know, I'm sure many of the digital platforms that that you have in house have helped you with uh, either remote working or keeping you connected globally. But I remember, you know, you describing how you are going to use uh, digital technologies in drug innovation, clinical development, and digital as a whole. Um, would you like to share some of the, you know, things that you've been doing in terms of uh, using and leveraging digital technologies at Amgen? 
Well, thanks, Kieran. You know, the, the last 18 months have been extraordinary for all of us when it comes to uh, accelerating our use of digital technologies, like the one that we find ourselves on uh, here today. Uh, and, you know, you've heard the uh, phrases that you know, in, in 10 months, we probably accelerated 10 years in terms of our uh, adoption of digital tools and technologies. Um, and, you know, that may well be true. So virtually across all of our business, we see opportunities to improve our use of digital, to um, to use uh, ways of reaching more patients more effectively uh, by deploying some of the new and quickly emerging technologies. So I would start, when you, when you think about Amgen, I would start with our commitment to human genetics. Uh, we are the world's largest player when it comes to using human genetics uh, for drug discovery and, and development. Um, we have a, a very considerable effort in that regard based in our subsidiary in Iceland. Uh, and so that is at its core, a, a data business. And so uh, trying to extract insight uh, from that large repository of genetic information is a digital challenge. Uh, in addition to the uh, you know, human genetic data, we of course have other omic data. So we have massive uh, proteomic experiments running uh, and lots of other uh, omic data that we're combining with our genetic information to try to understand what causes disease and try to understand uh, what we can do to, uh, uh, to, to compete against the disease processes. So it starts there for us, but like everybody else in the industry, we're also looking at digital as a way to um, uh, think better about the kind of molecules that we discover. And uh, we're really encouraged about um, uh, how rapidly the field of uh, protein structure and function uh, is evolving and, and how machine learning might be able to break some of the uh, important uh, um, uh, roadblocks that exist in, in that area. Um, and then in development, uh, in manufacturing, in sales and marketing, really across everything we do, we see opportunities to deploy uh, new digital technologies. So uh, clearly that is an area that we expect to see rapid development in. Um, and um, I think it's going to be, again, another exciting several years for us in the industry. I know we are running out of time, but uh, maybe I'll turn this over to Arthi Shah. Uh, former senior vice president from Eli Lilly, who I think wants to ask you a question, Bob. We, we, have, a, we have an expert in digital technology on our panel. So I'm, uh, Arti, feel free to elaborate on anything you just heard me say. No, I second what you say, Bob, but uh, I want to first just echo what uh, Kiran said, means what an amazing event, uh, rich in content and an awesome lineup with great leaders and speakers. So Karun and team, hats off to you. So um, uh, Bob, if you could elaborate on the two questions that uh, Kiran asked, you know, we saw this unprecedented collaboration and partnerships across pharma, big pharma, biotech, in terms of the COVID research, supply chain, manufacturing. What are some key lessons learned and what do you say are areas that pharma can continue to collaborate uh, to even make a bigger impact to mankind? That's one. And the second, I think uh, on the digital transformation, I agree we are all doing that. Um, what is the ecosystem, you know, means uh, uh, from a technology perspective with our tech partners and pharma, to truly unleash this power of data, advanced analytics, and the compute speed that's now available. Uh, uh, what would your message be to all the folks who are listening, both pharma and the tech uh, giants? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Artie, for those two questions. Um, first, let me just observe that um, I think the industry um, historically has done a great job of collaborating. I think big companies with small, uh, publicly financed with venture capital finance. So I think if you look at the history of biotechnology over the last 40 years, you can find many great examples of uh, therapies emerging that uh, were the product of, of companies coming together and collaborating at key moments in the life cycle of medicine. And so you know, that's something our industry has done pretty well through time. But I think we took it even to another level um, in, uh, uh, in the case of COVID-19. And if I may already just invoke uh, your uh, former firm, Lilly, uh, Lilly and Amgen, for example, came together very rapidly in a partnership to make uh, antibodies to try to neutralize COVID-19. Um, and the speed at which we agreed to collaborate and, and the extent to which we uh, threw in together, I think, um, reflected the urgency uh, of the pandemic. Uh, but that kind of collaboration, that kind of cooperation, um, uh, I think points the way forward when it comes to some of the big challenges that we still face uh, as an industry. So I'm hopeful that we'll see even more collaboration 
uh, even more of companies bringing together the best of their respective capabilities to address serious needs and to do it, you know, with a minimum of friction and a maximum of efficiency in the way that I think we and Lily were able to do together in the manufacturing collaboration that we entered into. But, you know, I also think it's important to, to highlight that uh, our success, even in that venture that I've just referred to, wouldn't have been possible without cooperation from regulators. And the question will be, how can we and regulators work together in the future uh, in, in the way that we were able to for COVID-19 and, and, and capture some of the benefits of speed and, uh, and uh, efficiency that come from collaborations, especially when the regulators are engaged. So, uh, you know, again, I think there are some things we can do, and I think we should all feel pretty encouraged about uh, the lessons that we learned from COVID-19 in that regard. Um, and then as regards the big picture, um, I, you know, I think you shined the light directly on it already. I think there's a huge opportunity uh, for the tools of digital technology and biotechnology to be brought together. Um, there are uh, some really exciting things happening at some of the world's leading academic institutions trying to bring uh, computational biology to life. Uh, the tools of machine learning or you know, other forms of artificial uh, intelligence to some of the questions that we still have about biology. So you know, we're just scratching the surface of our understanding of, uh, of biology. Uh, and I think digital technologies and the computational capabilities uh, that exist uh, in the digital world can help make a big difference. And I, again, I fully expect that you know, over the next decade, uh, some of the really exciting progress that we see will be as a result of uh, people trained in, uh, in technology coming together with people trained in biology. Uh, so thank you, Artie, for that question and giving me the opportunity to address that. So Bob, I know you said you wanted a hard stop at 10.55, but Sujay has been waiting here. So if he can ask you that last question. Right. Sujay from PricewaterhouseCooper, PwC. So why don't you ask your question? Thank you, Kiran. And uh, again, congratulations to Karun and his team for a superb event. Uh, Robert, very quickly, uh, given the challenges and the really high cost of drug development, how are you thinking? You actually said this a little bit in the earlier question, but how are you thinking about uh, potential partnerships or alliances, whether they are public or private, to further the R&D challenge or to bring drugs to market? Where could they add value in, in, in the way you're thinking today? Well, again, uh, Suji, what I would say is that if you look at Amgen through our 41 year history, um, at any moment in time, um, a significant fraction of our uh, medicines have been the result of uh, either in licensing or acquisition activity. Uh, and I think that's true really across all the leading innovators in our industry. So I would expect that that will uh, continue to uh, apply to the future, uh, just as it has in the past. Uh, and we will continue to, to look for innovative opportunities uh, for in licensing. For example, we uh, just uh, completed uh, the in licensing of a very novel uh, molecule, an antiox 40 molecule, with our friends at Kiowa Kirin. Uh, which we think is uh, relevant for the field of uh, atopic dermatitis and potentially other inflammatory diseases. And um, we'll look forward to bringing our skills to bear on uh, in collaboration with them and hopefully uh, develop a medicine that can make a big difference for patients. So I think it will continue to be a feature. For Amgen, it'll likely be in the areas where we're most uh, heavily concentrated. Uh, that includes oncology, uh, autoimmune disorders, uh, and uh, cardiology. So those are three areas where we're most active right now and looking for um, innovative uh, business development opportunities. But Kieran, I want to, again, I want to thank you uh, for uh, including me in your, uh, in your event this morning. And, and Andy, I want to congratulate you and, uh, and Karun for the success of, of the event. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. It was great to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Kiran. The poll starts now, and I won't talk because there'll be music after this. So please start, you know, polling. It's open for next one minute. Go ahead.
all is closing and uh, our back end didn't put the music i wish i was a singer i would have you know done something so in the upcoming panel after uh, we had the investment panel we have rajiv call uh, he is a good besides being a you know fund manager he also is a great musician and a rapper welcome back everybody and thank you very much to kiran and bob for a really terrific uh fireside chat and before we move into our next panel let's put up the polling results for the last question thank you very much to everybody who participated uh in the polling and actually for the first time today we've got actually a a neck and neck results so let's see the question was what is the most crucial step to building resilience against the next pandemic and by a, a slight margin um the um, choice b one out development of more patient reported outcomes oops Sorry, that was not. I have trouble reading on the screen, so I went to my notes and I went to the wrong note. So it was B, established infrastructure for more efficient research, collaboration, and data sharing, and that was neck and neck with build up global, diverse surveillance infrastructure. So thank you very much again for participating in the poll.